So really, it's not 32 bits. It's actually 20 bits of entropy here. So we, we can actually reduce 12 bits of entropy and reduce from 160 to 148. So that's pretty cool. But 148 is still a big number. But there's more. There's more we can do here. Let's say we're on Facebook. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Facebook, you'll know that there's a chat that you can use. And as soon as someone logs into Facebook, they appear on that chat. Well, what is that chat? That's basically an Ajax uh, request that your client is doing every few seconds, and it's checking to see, are there new people available? Are the people going offline? Are they, now, uh, are they now away? And when that happens, we get an HTTP response. Uh, using something like live HTTP headers, you can actually watch this in Firefox if you'd like, or TCP dump, or whatever you'd like. And what happens is, uh, we send a request, and then we get a response back that says, hey, you know, Matt just logged in, for example. Well, this is interesting. What if I sent, let's say, a request every single second to Facebook, just an Ajax request with my own program making that HTTP request? And then finally, I see someone comes on. Let's see, I see Rsnake. He comes online. Well, the HTTP server will actually send me every response. It sends me the date. Well, that date is the epoch the server epoch, not my client epoch. So I actually know by checking every second on Facebook, is, someone, is anyone new coming on? Is anyone new coming on? Is anyone new coming on? I know to the second when someone comes online. So that means if, I go, if someone goes onto Facebook, if our snake goes on Facebook, and he types in his credentials and he logs in, Facebook chat automatically comes up, and I get this, I'm sending my requests every second, I now see the second that he comes on. And if you remember, epoch was a 32 bits. The second thing is, I could send him a link. And if he clicks that link, hopefully it's, it's a non-malicious link at this point, right? It's something totally, uh, there's no XSS, it's just it's some, some web page that I'm able to acquire his IP address from. You know, it's just my blog, for example. And there's nothing malicious. You know, if there were, it wouldn't matter because he's probably blocking it anyway. So he visits my blog, Nambla. And he, uh, <clears throat> and he, and what happens is I watch my Apache logs, and of course I get his IP address. So if we take a look at that, we just acquired his IP address, 32 bits, and the epoch. Not only the epoch on my client side, not not when he came on on my computer, which wouldn't be, which would be beneficial, but not that much because. It's really about when he came on on the server because it's the server generating these cookies. We just reduced the epoch from the server. It sent, it sent us that date, and we just reduced another 32 bits. Plus that, negative, that 12 bits uh, from microseconds, we've just reduced 160 bits of random data to 84 bits. That's 76 bits. That's a lot. It's a lot of entropy. So now, the only thing left is the 64 bits, right? We're probably not going to reduce the microseconds. It's just it's too much time on the web, dealing with hops, so on and so forth, to try to reduce that. If you work really hard, you probably could. It's not worth it. So let's look at the randomness, or pseudo-randomness. So if you recall, it calls this LCG value function. An LCG is a, it's called a linear congruential generator. It's a type of pseudo-random number generator. Um, it's been studied for 20, 30 years now. There's a lot of information on it. We can take a look at the LCG in PHP. Now, if we take a look, we started looking at this, and uh, actually, Arshan Diversiagi and Amit Klein uh, pointed me out to, to looking at this stuff. And if we look at the LCG, we start seeing that it's actually really well known. Uh, it's actually really easy to reverse if we want to. And I started going down that path, like, wow, this is, you know, there's so much information on this. Maybe I can reverse this LCG and potentially reverse that random number. Well, that was definitely possible, but was a little difficult. Um, and what I found was there was actually a much easy, there was actually a, a bigger problem that, that was exposed. The seed. The seed of any random number generator is basically what creates all the entropy. When you create a, when you get a random number in any language, you typically are seeding that random number generator. Your seed is the one piece of random information that all other random numbers come from. If you know the seed at any point, you know every random number that's ever going to come out, in which case it's not even random anymore. If you can ever determine a seed, you'll know everything. 
So it's like the matrix, basically. <laughs> so if we take a look at the seed, basically when we call this LCG value function, it first seeds, if it hasn't seeded already, you typically only ever seed once. It seeds the uh, random number generator, and then we get a random number. Well, let's look at this seed. The seed is 64 bits. Um, and there, there are two values. There's basically this uh, S1 and S2. They're both 32 bits. You see here, let's take a look here. We do a, a get time of day. Let me just take a look at this slide. All right, so we're basically take, taking our, our get time of day. So basically when PHP starts up, or Apache starts up, or whatever is using PHP, we get the time of day. That's the epoch again. What time is it? We take the seconds, we XOR it with the ones complement of the microseconds. Uh, basically, we have 32 bits of entropy there. Then we have S2, which is the process ID of PHP. Um, that is the other 32-bit value. Now, let's, let's first take a look at S1. So S1, if we recall, it's this epoch XORed by the ones complement of microseconds. So what's that mean? Uh, basically, we have epoch the number of seconds in a day. That's hard to guess, right? It's hard to guess what time it is that Apache started, at least accurately. We might know that it probably started maybe in the last week or something like that. Um, but they're also using microseconds, which we'll never be able to guess. It's, just, it's too difficult to guess, you know, one in a million what they're, what they're using. And they use that to also XOR the, the seconds. The problem is they're taking the most variable data, the microseconds, and XORing it against the most variable part of the time. Well, in time, we, we know what year Apache probably started. We probably know what month. We might even know what day, probably not. But we know what month and year, but we don't know, let's say, what minute or hour. Well, that minute and hour gets randomized with the microseconds. So the data we didn't know is still data we don't know now that it gets XORed with this microseconds. The data we do know, for example, the, uh, the year and the month, we still know. So the very static fixed data remains the same. If we basically take the top and bottom possible microseconds and randomize our epoch with it, we get a difference of 12 days. What this means is if I can determine within a 12-day period of when Apache started or when this PHP process started, I can know what S1 is up to, tw uh, basically, I can reduce 12 bits from there because 12 bits of static information gets me 12 days. Now, what if I don't know within 12 days? You know, we have servers that are running for months, if not, you know, let's assume months, right? Well, most web servers, we can actually just send many, many requests to, and what happens? Well, typically there's a, a maximum number of servers that we can run at, uh, that will handle so many responses or, or requests. After, you know, so many thousand requests, it'll start over. So if you want to make a server restart, you just send many, many, many requests. It doesn't affect the users or anything like that. It simply respawns a new process. From then, we know exactly when it started, at least to the day. So we just reduced our 64-bit seed to 52 bits. Now, if we look at S2, that's the process ID. We all know process IDs, they're not too random. One problem here is it's 32-bit. This is 32 bits of the seed. Well, Linux only uses 15 bits for process IDs. So immediately, you're reducing 17 bits, just off the, off the bat without knowing anything about the system. If you can execute PHP, if you can find a vulnerability, or if you can get somehow local access to the system um, and do a PS, if you can execute PHP and get the process ID, if you can find the, uh, an Apache page that shows processes or shows the process ID of Apache running, you get the process ID. You now reduce the full 32 bits of S2. We take S2, which we now know the process ID, zero bits of entropy, plus the 20 bits of entropy from the microseconds, and we now have 20 bits of entropy total within the random number generator. So let's take a look. We have We've reduced everything but microseconds of when the cookie was established, and we've reduced everything but microseconds of when Apache or PHP started, so a total of 40 bits. We reduced 120 bits of entropy in that cookie. It's amazing. But wait, there's more. 
what we can do is we can actually take that seed value of the LCG, the 20 bits that we didn't know of when Apache started, and we can brute force that separately. We don't have to make it 40 bits. We can actually make it 20 and 20 bits, which is technically 21 bits. By brute forcing that 20 bits um, offline, which I provi provide code for doing, you can basically reduce in seconds, literally seconds, using a time memory trade-off to uh, reduce the entire thing down to 20 bits total. What this means is I can reduce your cookie to 20 bits or just over a million possible cookies and guess which cookie is yours. I can predict cookies at this point. What this means is on average with 500,000 HTTP requests, which is not hard to do in a day, I can now log in as you. Great success. I send 500,000 cookies uh, and uh, I now log in as you. So now I'm logged in as rsnake. Sorry, buddy. Um, and now I can do whatever I want. Literally 500,000 requests on average, a, a little over a million total. This is, this is scary. Um, at this point, I can email Anna as rsnake and start to set some things up. So I let her know to check out my, my website and help with my farm bill. Now, how do we fix this? All right, so PHP 5.3.2, um, I spoke to uh, the, P the PHP guys and they, they added more entropy, so that, that's awesome. Um, if you want more entropy, create your own session values. You know, one of the things about PHP is it's meant to be fast, right? They, they, they want it to be fast and portable. So they don't use things like, for example, debut random. They may in the future, but they don't for the entropy right now. So use your own entropy. Create your own seed if you want. I'm not telling you to go and create your own crypto. I'm saying use your own seed from randomness that you know is better than the randomness that's used around you. This attack is also difficult to execute. You're not going to be able to hack your bank overnight. You might, if they have a social network as part of it. <laughs> kind of like cool new bank, like Virgin Bank or something. Um, Facebook is not vulnerable to this. Let me just say that now. Uh, Facebook is not vulnerable. Please don't put me in jail again. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't do anything. This was, it was all, it was all uh, shopped. So Facebook uses hip hop. Their sessions are not using session start, but most things do. Cake PHP uses session start. By default, your PHP application probably uses a session start. Make sure you're an up to date PHP. Use more randomness if you can. Help my farm. Just grow some crops for me. So at this point, I emailed Anna. We're bonding. Um, as Robert. And I, and I got her to hit a link. Ooh, a link. Right? This goes back to the web browser. So I'm going to attack her network now. So, so you guys are familiar with this is your network. Right? This is your network on drugs. <laughs> well, you too. So we're going to talk about a NAT right now and how to break a NAT. So this is a NAT. This is your home NAT. Your NAT basically allows you to run multiple systems behind one public IP address, you know, in a nutshell. Um, we won't go into it much further than that. So you all have private IP addresses back here. You know, let's say this is your system, or this is Anna's system, as you can tell. And she's running behind this NAT. It doesn't matter if you have, let's say, uh, ports running on, on your system. If you have services running, for example, you're running Apache or whatever, it doesn't matter. Your NAT will actually block it out unless you're doing port forwarding or using a DMZ. Um, but, yeah, that's it for this slide. So what we're going to talk about first is something called XPS, cross-protocol scripting. Uh, you may have heard of it recently. Uh, it was made kind of big by uh, a well-respected group called GOATC Security. Um, so cross-protocol scripting. Basically, with an HTTP server, you can run it on any port. Um, a, little, a little more information here. With a hidden form, we can... We can